Thank you to law enforcement, fire services, emergency services, our military personnel around the world who keep us safe. In 1986, I was an FBI SWAT team member. 24 hours a day, little more than eating, sleeping, working out, and shooting. Heaven. One day I was returning from a covert firing range in Fallbrook, San Diego. It was better that we trained there because I was also the undercover agent in an important terrorism operation that remains classified even today. And I knew one of my squad mates had been investigating cross burnings as we were in Klan country. So as I was leaving the range, stopped at a stoplight, two individuals pulled up next to me, and I could tell out of the corner of my eye they were waving and taunting and they were screaming things, and this had to be the longest red light in San Diego County. When finally I just knew it had to turn green, I looked to my left, and as I did, they gave me a Sieg Heil, Heil Hitler salute. This incident revealed something to me, that at any moment we could be a stone's throw away from extremist activity and or violence. But I'm not here today to sow fear of Americans' extremists. I'm really here to arm you with information that might protect you and your family from radical thinking and action. Because in fact, every terrorist has a family. Every terrorist has a social network. So what if we could do something to keep our children from joining these hateful, violent organizations? I want to offer you a brief history of terrorism and extremist violence in the United States and how it evolved to where we are today. You know, for most people, terrorism began on September 11th, 2001. And as dramatic as that attack was by Al Qaeda, we have a long history of extremist violence in the United States. But let me give you the landscape. We're going to start with three categories to keep it simple. Race, religion, and issue orientation. So let's start with race. Those organizations that espouse racial supremacy have a long history in the United States. There are black and white supremacists, neo-Confederates who would have us return to the racist principles of the Civil War South, neo-Nazis, white power skinheads, to name a few. And lately, we've seen a resurgence of what we call racially driven hate speech or, in fact, hate crimes. So let's take, for example, Wade Michael Page, a neo-Nazi who decided one afternoon to attack the Sikh temple in Wisconsin, killing four people and injuring six others. Next is religion. This is the category that's most often associated with terrorism. However, we've seen this kind of activity for many years in our country. It's a category that says we have radical interpretations of the world's major religions, and not just Islam, but Judaism, Judaism and Christianity. We'll take, for example, Kevin Harfum, who planted a radio-controlled IED along the parade route in Spokane, Washington for the Martin Luther King Parade. He happened to be associated with the National Alliance, a supremacist organization that has both racial and religious overtones with a particular disdain for Jews. Last, there's issue orientation. Unlike racial and religious motivated groups, this group locks onto a specific issue, such as abortion, government authority, or even environmental preservation. So we have Andrew Joseph Stack, a member of the Sovereign Citizen Movement. By the way, in the most recent poll of law enforcement, the Sovereign Citizen Movement was ranked number one, ahead of Muslim extremists and armed militias. Mr. Stack decides one afternoon to write a very lengthy manifesto, burns his house to the ground, then goes on a suicide mission, crashing his Piper Dakota aircraft into the IRS building in Austin, Texas, killing himself and an employee seated at the desk. Interesting that over the years, as this incident is recalled, although he engaged in violence, killed an innocent civilian in furtherance of his political ideology, he's rarely, if ever, referred to as a terrorist. So now that you have an idea of the landscape, let's take a look at tra the trajectory of terrorism in the United States over the last several decades. In the 20th century, the FBI and a number of other federal organizations took on a number of compound-dwelling extremist groups. The Order, which is a white nationalist group. 
covenant sword and arm of the Lord, a quasi-religious anti-government movement that had a rural compound near Arkansas. Two years before I joined SWAT, some of my teammates were at a shootout with neo-Nazi Robert Matthews at Whidbey Island. It was intense. They talked about loading and reloading. What's interesting is that after that firefight and the death of Matthews, years later, white supremacists Tom Metzger and Richard Butler held rallies every year commemorating Matthew's death as if he were some kind of war hero. But you know, but these compound dwelling incidents, unlike today, failed to capture the imagination or attention of the American public. That is until one of their adherents parked a truck bomb in front of the Alfred P. Murrah building in 1995. And with that, Timothy McVeigh killed 168 people and wounded nearly 700 others. But what's interesting is that that story didn't begin there. McVeigh was at another compound incident involving the Barents Davidians in Waco. He decided the United States government had gone too far. They had killed women and children. He was going to do something about it. So as we look at people like McVeigh, we have to ask ourselves, how does this happen? Is there some cognitive opening? Is there some series of events that occurs in and or during their life where they're more receptive to some previously shaken ideas that they might have about violent action. The defining event of the 21st century was the attack on September 11, 2001. It caught us off guard both tactically and strategically. We had always given thought to an international attack on our U.S. assets abroad, or even a domestic incident targeting something here in the homeland. But as the 9-11 Commission report would state, we had a failure of imagination. The fact that foreign adversaries could be adaptive and intelligent enough to use commercial aircraft as weapons of mass destruction was something that we had long not even given thought to, but we were very, very wrong. On that day, you may have noticed or not that the congratulatory notes went online. May the war be started. Death to his enemies burned the World Trade Center to the ground. Like you and me, we were thinking Al-Qaeda. It's got to be someone who was responsible for the attack. But instead, those congratulatory remarks came from an individual named August Kreese, a KKK leader in Pennsylvania who reached out to Ayman al-Zawahiri, number two in command of Al-Qaeda at the time, and said, I want to join you. And we can do this because here in America, the cells are already in place. Surprising camaraderie was demonstrated between extremists and terrorist groups at that point. Unfortunately, no event has done more to spur the recruitment of extremists in America than the election of the first American, African American president. The Obama factor. When I was Chief of Homeland Security and Intelligence at the Los Angeles International Airport, and units under my command worked with Secret Service to protect heads of state from around the world, when Senator Obama came to the airport, Secret Service told me they quadrupled their efforts as he was traveling around the country. On the day of his election, I went to the website for Stormfront, the first and only white supremacist website in the world. They received so many hits on election day, their site crashed. Upon his election, he received 30 threats a day the first year a fourfold increase over his predecessor, President George W. Bush. And interestingly enough, the militia movement grew by 755%. If you went to, I, and I don't recommend this, but I often visit these sites, I went to the site for the National Socialist Movement, the fastest growing and most dangerous neo-Nazi organization in the United States. And on that site, they said, our worst fears have come true. We have a black president, and he has a Jew for the chief of staff, referring to Rahm Emanuel. Meanwhile, we've seen an increase in what some call lone wolves, which I prefer to call self-starters, people that operate with a lack of coordination, command, or control from any foreign terrorist organization. The Sonayev brothers, despite having lived here for most of their lives, decided to put a bomb at the end of the Boston Marathon. I was invited to testify before Congress at the first and only hearing on the Boston Marathon attack. And on that day, I told our elected leaders why the Tsarnaevs were indicative 
of the kind of threat we have and the kind of threat we will face in the future. Not because they were Muslim, but because they were American. Not because they adhered to one ideology, but in some cases embraced a complex compilation of several motivations. Older brother Tamlin Sarnayev, by the way, subscribed to a number of white supremacist publications. In his materials after his death, we found that he was a Holocaust denier, believed that 9-11 was a conspiracy. He even had an, amongst his writings a quote that Hitler had it right. What's really interesting and dangerous is that we see this interesting nexus between a hatred for two specific things, that being the United States government and the state of Israel. And so as I spend a lot of time in prison these days, not as an inmate, <laughs> doing research, because prison can in fact be an incubator for extremism and radicalization. You may or may not know shoe bomber Richard Reed, the alleged 20th hijacker Zacharias Musawi, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, who was the leader of al-Qaeda in Iraq, which has now morphed into ISIS or ISIL, were all radicalized in prison. So on my visits there, I've seen a number of things and talked to a lot of men. In this case, we have a Hispanic gang member who goes into prison as a Satan worshiper, converts to Islam. And for those who would be prone to suggest we can profile, how would you ever profile a Mexican former Satan worshiping Muslim? We've tried profiling here with great failure. World War II, we interned 110,000 Japanese. Two-thirds of them were citizens. Half of them were children. Many families were separated when they were put in the internment camps. And at the end of the war, four people were arrested on suspicion of espionage, and none of them were of Japanese or Asian descent. And so the nexus of ideo extremist ideology in, in prison really comes to the fold here in Los Angeles in 2005, the JIS plot, which their Arabic name translates as the Assembly of Authentic Islam. There, Kevin James masterminds the entire plot from Folsom Prison. He radicalizes LeVar Washington. And when LeVar Washington's paroled six months later, he's charged with going out and recruiting more members, which he does successfully, recruiting two college students with no criminal history, Hamad Samana, who's at Santa Monica College, and Gregory Patterson, who's working at LAX and has an application into the airport police. They target symbols of American and Israeli power. The El Al ticket counter at Tom Bradley International Terminal, the Israeli consulate on Wilshire Boulevard, several synagogues throughout the city, and a number of National Guard centers. What this does is it really shows us the complex nature of what we're dealing with. Over the last several decades, the real question now is what can we do as a country to better address this threat? The first thing we have to do is understand it's not something that happens over there. It happens in America by Americans. Radicalization is the issue here, and we have to try to disrupt that path of radicalization. But unfortunately, it's the most overused, misunderstood term in the national security lexicon. Simply put, it's the, when a person identifies, embraces, and engages in the furtherance of extremist ideologies and goals. But it's not a fixed trajectory with specific signposts along the way that after you check off a number of boxes for suspicious activity, you've got an extremist violence, violent individual or a potential terrorist. But there are three components that we know of. An alienated but altruistic individual who embraces a legitimizing ideology and lives in an enabling community. And it's that community that's most susceptible to positive influence with, with regards to reducing the risk of radicalization and recruitment. So I'm going to give you this. We need to talk about a community-based effort that enhances social morality, integrity, and responsibility for these things. I'm going to offer you the, uh, another phrase without an acronym, but it's all about being safe. And so what have we really covered today? We know that we have social networks. Violent extremists have social networks. You know yours. Monitor them. Monitor the ones of your kids. This is not something that happens in a vacuum. By doing that, we can make this a hostile environment to those individuals who, do us, who would do us harm. It's time to act. 
Countries around the world have done it for decades. See something, say something should be also be followed by do something. 40% of the attacks that are thwarted in the United States are done so because citizens call and let people know that something is wrong. Fight intolerance. Intolerance is a basic component of extremist behavior. And we need to push back against that with every fiber of our being. And last but not least, educate yourself. Find out what's happening in your community and what's being done about it. You know, this is not some national character flaw. Homegrown terrorism, unfortunately, is a fact of life for many countries, and we've joined that fraternity. But security is everybody's business, and we can meet this challenge. And most importantly, as we've done for centuries, we'll continue to do things, because we understand one very simple phrase. This is not the end, it's not the beginning of the end, but it certainly is the end of the beginning. Thank you very much.